Hello, and welcome to this webinar, Rethinking the Prospectus. I'm Nathan from Smile, uh, a digital agency exclusively for the education sector, and I'll be your host for today. It's another stellar turnout with over 100 people uh, representing over 40 universities from all across the globe. And today we are also live streaming on YouTube and LinkedIn too. Today, we're looking at the prospectus. As we come out of a pandemic, we juggle the decisions between the physical and digital worlds. The future has been reached faster. So today we look at something that so far has resisted change. Now, this webinar has been scheduled for about an hour, uh, but I recently conducted a poll and heard that people like shorter webinars. So today we're gonna to be a little bit shorter than usual hopefully give you a little bit of time back in your day to digest today's webinar, uh, maybe even grab a quick cup of coffee. Today we'll be looking at what other universities are doing. We have a fantastic guest speaker who's gonna be showing us how you can find out what prospective students want and looking at what happens from digital first change. I'm also really excited to show you what we've been doing with one university in particular. So let's get into it. Our guest speaker today is Alex from Akiro. Akiro is a big name in education, uh, and we got in touch when we started using Student Pulse, which is this incredible playground of data collected by real prospects and users uh, and students. Um, Alex is the product manager at Akiro, and later on he's going to uh, show us more about Student Pulse and how it can help you to understand what your customers really want to know. And Alex is joined by Matt Lees, creative director and co-founder at Smile, an award-winning digital agency that designs and builds websites exclusively for the education sector. Uh, Smile has over a decade of experience in flagship websites, microsites, campaigns, everything in between. Um, lots of experience ex integrating external software systems, uh, like APIs, accessibility workflows, personalization, virtual open days, I, I could go on. Uh, but Matt is also a co-founder at Edupack. Edupack aims to automate higher ed web publishing and governance. If you're interested in how you can build websites for your university quicker, cheaper, and with better tooling to manage them, you can find out more at edupack.dev. Uh, you can find out more about Smile, however, at wearesmile.com. And if you like content about digital marketing, then you might want to follow our social channels. And we've got some sh handy shortcut links to here. Uh, pick your poison, put in that forward slash, and uh, you'll be teleported to your location of choice. Now today, we'd also love to hear your questions. Uh, the Q&A is open on Zoom, but you can also message us over on YouTube and LinkedIn. We're not monitoring those channels, but uh, we will, uh, do our best to answer your questions and any that we don't get round to we will put in our webinar roundup that we'll publish on our website more details on that later we also have a poll which will be live shortly and we'll be reviewing and sharing those results later too so without further ado i'd like to invite matt to the stage who's going to show you what university responses have been like so far Thanks, Nath. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about the current landscape and what the future may hold for your prospectus. So let's jump straight in. The prospectus is a stalwart part of student recruitment cycles around the world. I think it's fair to say it can be considered a pretty solid part of the furniture. Universities have been printing prospectuses since before I attended university. That's a few more years ago than I like to think about. We wanted to collect some examples to see a brief top level history of the prospectus over the years. And you can see some of those on this slide, starting with the older examples to the top and the newer ones towards the bottom. We were actually quite surprised that the oldest example we found dates all the way back to 1968, and that was from the University of Warwick. So I think it's fair to say that the examples collected show that not too much has changed over the years. I started university in 2006, and a prospectus picked up at the university fair today wouldn't be too different from the ones I collected all those years ago. 
But even beyond that, there's clear similarities between almost all of the examples we collected. You can see that in these two examples from the University of Birmingham, one on the left from 1972 and the other on the right being the current 2022 prospectus. Undoubtedly, internal content will have seen some changes over the years as the needs and desires of prospects have evolved. But bearing in mind there's 50 years between these two examples, the format is almost identical. And we thought this was a particularly good example, as even the cover images are quite similar. We've been lucky enough to work with, Bern with the University of Birmingham, and they do have a beautiful campus. Both of these examples playing on that to help entice prospects. So in large, not too much has changed for the last 50 years. There is the odd exception to the rule, however. We came across this really interesting example from the University of Kent. In a Facebook post, this was described as a video prospectus. Exactly what that is or how it was shared with prospects back in the 80s, we're not too sure. But I believe we've got a few people watching today's webinar from Kent. So if anybody there has any additional insight, please feel free to share it in the chat. It's a couple of minutes long, so I won't let it play all the way through, but here's a taster for you. I think you'll agree it's a little bit different from the norm, but the music has me hooked. You can see it in all its glory in our, in our roundup. So given the examples we collected, um, we started to wonder, why is the prospectus so resistant to change? If we cast our minds back over the last two decades, I bet we can all recall a lot of change. And for me, this video I'm about to show sums it up pretty perfectly. Again, I won't let it play all the way through as it's around four minutes long, but you can see the full length video in our roundup. Okay, so go ahead and lift up the box. You have four minutes to dial that phone number. That's it? That's it. With that phone. Wait, so you have to push uh, it, right? Kyle, move your butt over. I don't want your butt in the video. Look, 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 there you go. Look. It's all the way from here. Yeah. Seven. Oh, no, zero's all the way. We'll pause that there. That there. I can distinctly remember my parents having a phone like this when I was younger. And my, my wife even bought one more recently in an effort to be fashionable. But these two young guys have no idea how to work it. To bring this back to the prospectus, the way in which users consume content has evolved. The current cohort of prospective university students have grown up in a digital world. They're almost every move is online, more often than not using devices that they carry in their pocket. Think entertainment, shopping, news, taxis, dating, everything's available at their fingertips. Even the way we buy cars has evolved, and that feels a particularly relevant example to the university prospectus. A few years ago, if you were interested in buying a new car, you'd probably visit a showroom, sit in a few different models, and come away with a printed brochure to help you decide on the finer details of your new motor. But in recent years, car manufacturers have stopped producing those brochures, and moved large parts of the process online. More powerful and intuitive digital experiences now, now help us to configure our perfect car in the right color, with the right wheels, and with all the add-ons we could dream of, all from the comfort of our front rooms. So to revisit the question, why is the prospectus so resistant to change? We look to Akiro's Student Pulse re reports for some answers. The latest report shows that 11% of students still rank the prospectus as the number one factor when making the university decision. It also shows that over the last month, 48% of students have received a prospectus and 54% would like to have received one. So appetite for the prospectus still exists. In our preparation for this webinar, we spoke with Alex about the data and asked what, if any, he considered the driving factors behind this data to be. In large, it appears to be driven by a few key things. Students want to receive something tangible, something shareable, something where the corners of key pages can be folded for a parent or friend to take a look at. 
and at a time when the amount of post we receive is in decline, maybe even a rare post or delivery is enough to keep the appetite there. Perhaps pressure from parents or teachers to order prospectus is another factor. We did question this last item. Are parents and teachers promoting the prospectus because this was their experience of a university application? That would seem odd when we think back to things like the rotary phone. If those same parents tried to get their kids to buy a rotary phone, I'm pretty confident the answer would be a firm no. As you'll likely expect, the latest report also shows that university pros uh, prospects begin their journey on the main university website. When considering where students go for university info, the flagship website is the clear front runner with almost 80% of students going there. Followed again, as we may expect by UCAS. Interestingly, the prospectus was lower, lower on the list than I thought it would be, coming in as the 10th most selected item, falling behind social media and somewhat, again, surprisingly to me, friends, but ahead of parents and even ahead of direct contact with the institution. This insight poses yet more questions. If the experience or opinion of a friend holds more weight than the prospectus, does the format need rethinking to play more heavily on this? And perhaps a slightly more drastic move, if all of the information is available various, via various other sources, is there any need for a prospectus at all? We took a look at the current landscape to give us a better idea of what the prospectus looks like today. At random, we chose 12 universities and looked at how they were handling their prospectus. We requested printed prospectuses from four universities and went through PDF versions of others. On screen, you can see a few of our key findings. 10 out of 12 of the universities we looked at still offered a printed prospectus. On average, these were about around 150 pages in length, and on average, 90 of those pages were dedicated to course listings. When we consider that a student will only be interested in a handful of courses at each institution, this feels like a lot of waste, a lot of pages, let's say 80, that are completely meaningless to the person reading it. The cost of producing such a large printed document is high. And with nine out of 10 students stating that a university's, university's sustainability policies are important to them, we're not just talking financial cost here. Some universities seem to be tackling these issues. One prospectus we saw had no course listings whatsoever. Others had course tables with key info, but no detail, instead pushing users to the main website for this content. And this seems like quite a smart move, given how often courses and course content are updated and how much of a headache CMA compliance can be. Once a prospectus goes to print, it's almost impossible without incurring substantial costs to make any changes, but everything living online can be updated within a few clicks. This leads nicely onto the last example on this slide. One university that had no prospectus at all, no printed prospectus, no PDF, and no digital prospectus. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's a few of the traditional printed prospectuses that we received. In large, they were everything we expected them to be. But interestingly, two out of four universities sent us both the prospectus and a mini guide. And BCU, who's you can see on, on the left, they're obviously aware of some of the points raised on the previous slide, because they haven't actually produced a prospectus for 2022-23. COVID meant they had a lot of last year's prospectus left, so they've been sending these out in place of producing a new one. They did, however, also send a flyer detailing parts of the prospectus that are now out of date, which further highlights the issues of print being timestamped and difficult to update. One of the other big issues we saw with the printed prospectus is the wait to receive it. For one university, naming no names, it took almost a month for our prospectus to be delivered. The wait was so long, in fact, that this photo was taken before it arrived. In fairness to the others, they arrived in a more timely manner, but even they can't compete with the immediacy that online experiences allow. There are some seeds of change. We've already mentioned unis who have largely cut courses out of their prospectus, but Warwick deserves a mention. Warwick is the only institution that we came across that no longer produces a prospectus. Their reason for doing so is that they can provide more detailed and up-to-date information through their website. When you visit the prospectus page on their site, you see a data capture form prompting you to sign up for updates tailored around your subject choice. 
this definitely feels like a bold move, but to some extent, we think fair enough. We'd love, however, to know what, if any, impact this has had on their recruitment numbers and what prospects have been saying about the move. Oxford are another uni that have taken the bold move of no longer printing the prospectus. They have, however, replaced their printed prospectus with a digital version. And we're not talking a PDF here. They don't count in our eyes. We saw a couple of examples of digital prospectuses. And to be honest, we were left a little bit underwhelmed by both. A digital prospectus has got to be intuitive, engaging and experiential. Neither of the examples we saw really achieved this. We think it's great that they've been bold enough to stop printing a prospectus, but in both cases, the online versions do little to replace the experience of those traditional prospectuses. In large, this felt like a duplication of content from the main website. Course listings even linked to the main site for detail, which left us asking, what was the point when the content already exists there? So what's next for the prospectus? I appreciate that my segment of this webinar so far may have posed more questions than it has answers. But I think in large, that's down to the fact that the future of the prospectus is not a one size fits all affair. We, we know that many universities will continue to print a prospectus as they have done for the last 50 years or so. And on the surface, data suggests that's not an awful idea. Others will take a hybrid approach, continuing to print prospectus of some form, but moving some of its content online. And then there will be those who push ahead with either a digital prospectus or with no prospectus at all, relying on their website to do more of the heavy lifting. But in a webinar entitled Rethinking the Prospectus, None of these approaches really do the title any justice. In our prep, we spoke at length with Alex about some of the data from Student Pulse and what the future of the prospectus might look like if we take some of that insight on board. I'm going to hand you over to Alex shortly, who will give you a little more detail and context behind the insight they've gathered. But for us at Smile, it confirmed what we've suspected for a few years now. There's a real opportunity to push the prospectus forwards and to begin changing perceptions. We're not talking a PDF version of a printed book anymore, and we're not talking about reskinning website content and sticking it in a microsite. For us, these approaches don't offer anything different from the printed book. They're single use. Prospects gather the bits of info that are relevant to them and then discard them and rarely return. But what if the prospector served more as a portal, something that evolved with prospects as they move through the funnel? a place where they can gather the initial insight they need, but then return to at later stages to discover more. This opens opportunities for the prospectus to serve prospects more accurately and for longer, perhaps a place where conversations can happen between prospect and institution. Sample lectures and chat sessions with academics could even happen inside the prospectus, or even where students can make connections with their peers before they enroll. The bottom line is the prospectus should aim to be the first port of call for prospects, no matter where they are in the cycle. For example, I know Alex is going to talk about a growing desire for fresh as week information and reservations from, from prospects around mental health provisions, subjects the prospectus could surely look to take in. Just before I hand over to Alex, I'd like to talk to you briefly about some work we've been doing with the University of Gloucestershire, where we've planted the seeds of this new approach. Last year, Gloss approached us with the challenge of delivering a digital prospectus. I'm gonna briefly talk you through a couple of the key objectives our work aimed to achieve and how having a solid understanding of their audience really helped to drive the project forwards. As I've mentioned throughout, one of the biggest problems with traditional printed prospectuses is relevancy particularly when it comes to courses. We were keen to overcome this, so we went through a lengthy process of designing and refining user journeys. Now, in the Gloss Prospectus, users, users are first presented with two options, to see everything or to personalize their prospectus. Seeing everything is essentially a shortcut for visitors who are time poor. However, choosing the latter option takes them through a different flow where they select the courses they're interested in. Doing so not only refines the core courses that are displayed, but also delivers relevant content such as campus info, facilities, and even the most appropriate accommodation choices. There are further ways to refine the content of your prospectus as you move through. 
hiding bits that don't interest you and saving the bits that do. We see this as the digital equivalent of folding over the corners of pages that you're interested in. The result is a new online experience. It aims to replace the traditional experiences of both the prospectus and the website, but not replicate them. This was key to our approach throughout. Printed prospectuses are great because they're so easy to share. You can flip through, find a key piece of info and hand it over to someone else to take a look. This was something we were keen to keep in Gloss's new prospectus. Once a user has been through the initial steps, they can send their prospectus to friends and family with a shareable link. However, to do so, they need to register. The added benefit of this is that they can return at any point to the prospectus and pick up where they left off. We also built in, built in some nice personalization to enhance the experience for those returning users. This comes with the benefits for the institution as well. One of the other issues with printed prospectuses is that once they're sent to a prospect, they're somewhat lost in a black hole. Follow-up comms can help to understand their impact, but it's difficult to accurately report on their successes and failures. Taking the prospectus online allowed more accurate tracking from the off. But with user registrations, we were able to take this to the next level, giving the university the opportunity to learn about the content that's engaged with most and adversely, the content that simply isn't working. They're able to align this with course and subject areas to grow their understanding of users further. In turn, they can adapt to trends almost immediately rather than bottling up ideas and waiting for next year's prospectus to come around. Gloss have a long-term vision for their prospectus and heading into its second year, we were already beginning to review and offer suggestions for refinement. Gloss had a solid understanding of their users. They'd done their research and they knew what their users wanted. And that was key to the successes of the project, helping us to make calculated decisions grounded in real data. And the services out there to help you understand your users. And that seems like the perfect time for me to hand over to Alex from Akira, who will tell you a little bit more about how they can help, your, help you understand your users in more detail. Brilliant, thank you, Matt. Um, and also thank you um, to both of you for inviting me to join the session um, today. It's been really interesting going through the preparation for this and, and having conversations with you about prospectuses and the work you've done on Gloucestershire and, and where you see that going. Um, yeah, it's been fascinating. Um, so what I wanted to, um, to touch on are really the different ways that institutions can identify the types of content that should be going into these more agile, digital first prospectuses, um, however they are delivered, whether they are that sort of portal approach um, or, or something brand new. Um, for a little bit of context, so I am um, I'm responsible for the strategic direction and development of our technology platform, Akiro, um, and that is all about understanding the data across a range of different um, metrics from looking at uh, what students are feeling and thinking, which I'll, I'll talk about today, through to advertising data, through to benchmarking, through to um, academic league table performance, and how all of that can then be filtered through to power your advertising and then improve your conversion. Um, so what I wanted to do, let me share my screen and I will put up student pulse in front of us. So hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Um, so what we have done here is to pull together student opinions, thoughts, feelings, motivations, the platforms that they use into a tool that allows student marketers to understand what's going on in the sector. Um, Combining that with this idea of a digital first prospectus, allowing institutions to create content that engages users, but also allows them to update that content in line with the changing challenges faced by prospects in a more agile way. What this enables us to do is to start to identify exactly what those challenges are, what they're facing at particular times and how that is evolving over time and when you should be reaching out to them with specific kind of messaging. Um, so we've pulled that together and we have utilized our student panel 
and ask prospective and current students every month what matters most to you when making educational choices um, and also how does that expectation marry up with the reality with what you've been um, experiencing what you've received from institutions and what that experience has been like this tool is um, completely free um, to the sector so we don't charge for this um, if you have an Akira account you can log in and access it if you don't have an Akira account then you can sign up on the website for one completely free of charge um, so what I wanted to do was sort of go into this and start thinking about a couple of these kind of highlights um, across um, the sort of overall month, as well as the decision making, well-being and the media sections. So starting off with those monthly highlights, um, as Matt mentioned, something that was coming out quite a lot this month is students not feeling like they are receiving enough information regarding Freshers' Week and sports and societies and I think that's quite obvious why that is a concern and why they are looking for that information because they have spent the last 18 months um, at home trapped at home um, without um, as much social contact as they used to their school lives have been completely disrupted and so really top of mind and it, you, you is such a, a you know a difficult experience for them is thinking about how they are going to be making friends and how are they going to be connecting people with people and what provision is there from the university for those kind of connections which is why it's so important to think about how have your students your current students been making those connections be they physically be they virtually um, and communicating that to the new um, the new cohort coming through cost and affordability continuously um, a big concern um, for obvious reasons um, and the support given by institutions for their mental health is also a big um, a, a big challenge a big um, ask that they are they're looking for universities to support them with um, and then finally um, from a postgraduate perspective there's increasing numbers of students post uh, you know after they finish their undergraduate not looking at postgraduate study and rather going straight into work um, and that's that's what our, our panel are telling us that they 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 want to go into the employment route rather than further study so using these prospectuses as a way of communicating not just the immediate undergraduate um, courses but also the progression pathways for those students. What does that lead on to from a career perspective, but also from a postgraduate study perspective? Moving on to our decision-making section. First of all, I just wanted to sort of focus on um, the where, where are prospective students? So if we scroll down here, we can see where are prospective students at their journey this month? started thinking about going to university, started proactively searching. We can see down here requested a prospectus is, uh, is on about 18%. That's where they are. This is really key for understanding when is a good time to send out your prospectus. So rather than the, the prospectus being a reactive thing that people seek and, and download, thinking of it as a proactive tool as part of your advertising, your marketing and your nurture and your conversion. Um, I think that's really important to find out when are people looking for it and get it into their hands and having it a, from a digital first perspective means that you can get scale um, in a way that printed prospectuses are, are limited. Um, also, we've got um, barriers down here. So barriers are, these are the things that are blocking um, students from taking those, those next steps. Similar to what we've said before, it's about the mental health side of things. If we look down here, mental health, their confidence in their academic ability, finding it hard to make friends. All of these are things that can be communicated through these digital first prospectuses in, in really, you know, really, really nice ways. And it links back to what Matt was saying earlier about 
what's the future for the digital first prospectus and, and the prospectus in general and the future is not just a digital version of your current prospectus but it is something that connects with a student on an emotional level and gives them that kind of experience and is your opportunity to to sell the institution beyond the the capabilities of the website next we have our well-being section so up here, um, this is where we can start to look at what kind of content can we be creating, whether that's for prospectuses, whether that's for, for advertising. Um, some of these things, if we have a look down here again, stress about academic performance, social isolation, job security, all of those things are things that you can address in a range of different ways through the prospectus, through online, online campaigns. Um, and I think this is, is really interesting here around the strategies that students are using to manage their well-being. And so thinking about this and thinking about how can we how can we um, provide these kind of services and this support to our, our current students, even, even beyond the scope of, of rethinking the prospectus. And then the final part that I wanted to touch on here was just around media. And so these are the websites and channels um, that students are going to to ask questions. Um, and so we've already looked at um, some of these about about where they're going, university websites, UCAS. But a really key thing to to broaden that out is this around how much do students trust those sources of news and, and current affairs and, and, and information? Because you'll see that although you know, we go down here and, and can see that they're accessing Instagram, you know, 52 percent of people are accessing it multiple times a day. Social media content is the least trusted of what we're looking at here. So it's to think about how do you make sure that your institution from a, a, a brand perspective is on the right kind of sites. Um, whether that's through your advertising, whether that's, um, you know, partnerships and, and direct media buying. And we actually have a student marketplace that collates all of those trusted websites um, and the audience that we know are going to be engaged and, and pull together that those successful advertising campaigns, which, again, you can access access through Akira. So the only other element that I really wanted to touch on was like a little bit more broadly about how does um, the prospectus fit into your overall strategy. Um, we've talked a little bit about putting it into advertising and into nurture campaigns, but because the ability to track and report on performance from digital, um, digital medium is so much more advanced than, than what you can do with print, you can start to be really clever with how you are providing this information to your users. For example, by sending this out, you could ask for you know, the bare minimum information. So name, email, that could be it, um, in order to get them to download the prospectus or to access the portal. From there, you can then use the prospectus to capture further data as and when they're Interest is, interest is peaked by certain things. It could be about accommodation. It could be about lifestyle in order to augment your CRM with that additional data around courses of interest, around you know, their, uh, whether they want to sign up and attend open days, be they in person, be they virtually. Um, and that kind of progressive profiling of your students and that augmenting of your own institutional first party data is incredibly important because all of that can then be used to power your top of funnel outreach. So by understanding your audiences better and better and, and having more context and understanding of what they're interested in, you can then target the people who are like them through custom audiences, through lookalike audiences, through remarketing and retargeting. You can really utilize that data to, to power everything that you're doing from a, an outreach perspective. And so with that, I will, uh, I will hand back over and I will stop sharing my screen. Hand back over to Nathan. Lovely, thank you so much, Alex. <clears throat> really, really interesting stuff. Um, so now it's 
time for a, a few questions. We've had quite we've had quite a few questions coming actually more than more than I was expecting. Before we do get to questions, I'm just going to close our poll. So going once, going twice, and uh, the results. Let me share those results with everybody. So the results are, are, are really interesting. Um, only one person has said that it's 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 never going to happen, uh, but over half of people in our Zoom um, webinar have said that they're thinking about it. And in fact, 21% are saying that they've already started work. And uh, uh, most surprisingly, I think for me, is that 23% have said that they already have one. Um, so I think you can definitely see that there's there's a big trend here that people are at least starting to consider it. And I think it really plays into the fact that you know the pandemic has accelerated the future and things like that. So looking forward to uh, uh, to seeing some of those those new digital first prospectus experiences. I think that's that's going to be really interesting to see. So thank you everybody that uh, submitted an answer to our poll. Uh, some questions. First up, Alex. <clears throat> From what we've talked about, what do you think the future of the prospectus is? Thinking about the content that it includes i i think it is um it's all about providing a personalized dynamic experience to the individual um it's something that universities will be thinking about a lot from a, a range of different um perspectives whether that is from advertising and, and marketing about really speaking to the to the individual student um but also from the prospectus, I think making sure that what you have on offer is tailored to the kinds of courses, the kinds of programs, um, the level of study that they're looking for, um, where they are in the decision making process. Like, have you got, you know, a, a version of the prospectus that we should be thinking about right now will all be about pushing for those applications for attendance at open days really the kind of awareness elements of, of these campaigns whereas then after you you know you move post january february march time it's then it's thinking about applicant days it's thinking about fostering that sense of, of community and um and connection with the university for those students that should be you know the real focus of the prospectus and so having something that's personalized, dynamic and timely, I think is is what we'll see a lot more in the future. And, and so do you think that the data uh, kind of supports this argument that, that there are seeds of change in what students want? I think I think it does from certainly from the sense of students are very, very savvy about what they want to find out. Um, and they will be able to find, you know, they are looking to find those things out in the quickest, most easy yeah. ways that they want. Um, yeah. So whether that is about having those kind of cut up elements of those prospectuses available on social channels or um, or small bits, snackable, more you know, slightly more snackable content on the website. I think it's it's definitely borne out by the data um, in terms of where they're going to find out that information. Awesome. Well, we have a, a question for you specifically, actually, Alex, from the audience. Uh, Karen Hall asks, do you have data on colleges as well? So the majority of the data is looking at prospective undergraduate students. So they are the ones who are looking predominantly for university. So the majority, they're, they're planning to go to un university. But we do also have data from that age group who are looking at other channels. So whether they are looking at apprenticeships, going to straight mm. into work to gap years, we do have that um, that data available in the system as well. Uh, uh, we have a, another uh, question. Does the data that you've used focus on UK students or does it represent international student views, perspectives and journeys too? Very good question. So at the moment it is UK focused um, and these are UK students and what they're looking for. But what we are also doing at the moment, we are looking at broadening this out um, initially for US students, but also then across um, much more globally around international students and their motivations and their thoughts, their feelings um, about applying for institutions ac across the world. Great. Uh, now, uh, we've got so many questions that I don't think we'll have time to cover them all. 
um, but in, in perhaps a record first for us, we actually have somebody with their hand up in the audience. So if it's OK with you two, I'd like to uh, invite them to the stage to ask the question, if that's OK. Amazing. Oh, they've disappeared. They oh. obviously got stage fright. There we go. Well, we, we, have, we have another one here, which I think is really interesting. It's got quite a few upvotes as well. I'm in uh, Lydia, Lydia Munro says, I'm in a small team. We are committed to accessibility, but do not have a digital prospectus. We have a limited amount of people and not all stakeholders are on board with it. I want to reduce how many prospectuses we print for sustainability reasons and put that money in developing a digital one. Of course, we will still print some. And, I, and if anyone needs a Braille version, we would do that. But I feel as though I'm at a stalemate trying to trying to go digital. Any advice? I mean, Matt, <laughs> the common stakeholder debate of trying to push people forward. Any, I know this is an incredibly tricky one, and I'm sure that we'll come up with a, a, a longer answer for this, perhaps for our roundup post. But any initial thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I, I, think, I think the big thing is using the data to help convince those stakeholders that, that it's the right thing to do. Uh, there's, there's various things that, that can be done. We've obviously got the, the kind of upfront insight and information that, that services like Akiro can, can offer, but then we can go further than that. So um, there's prototyping tools that have uh, come on a long way in recent years. So even down to being able to show those stakeholders what a digital prospectus might look like and get them on board with, with that before it, it goes into build. So that there's various points at which we can, you know, we could help to convince those stakeholders it's the right move. And and Matt, again, what what are the advantages of getting it right? What why why not just do this as part of say a main flagship website project? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And, you know, we, we cited one example there, uh, University of Warwick, who have scrapped a prospectus entirely. Um, I, I think for me, getting your prospectus right there's there's key differences between the prospectus and and the, the website Cur currently they're kind of both these huge portals of information where users need to go and they need to hunt out the information uh, the work that we've done with with Gloucester is all around relevancy and personalization mm -hmm. and making making that experience relevant to the user so it, it it's about offering a different experience i think awesome well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think we better start wrapping up. Um, so thank you to everybody that's joined us today. Um, if you are interested in exploring what a digital first uh, strategy might look like for your institution, then I would love to chat with you. Uh, you can feel free to grab me on email, telephone or LinkedIn. Uh, my details are on screen now. I'm, I'm actually on holiday at the moment, but I will pick them up next week. Uh, but yes, I would love to speak with you if you are considering this. Um, at Alex, uh, if, if you're interested in finding out more about Akiro, and I know one of the questions was, how, how, do, I, how do I get to this stuff? But um, one thing from Alex here, if you're interested in finding out more about Akiro and what it can do for you, there's a round table discussion happening on August 26th. Go get yourself signed up. I think there's going to be a ton of great things coming out of this. But uh, Alex, any any other plugs from yourself here? Yeah, definitely. So so please, please do come along to our, our enrollment roundtable. It's one of our favorite topics, which is about enrollment attribution and, and how you can really track the ROI and the value of, of, um, of your outreach. Um, and we've got a couple of our, our partners on there joining us. Um, if you'd like to have access to student polls, do just go to akiralabs.com um, and we've got all the links in there for, for you to sign up. Super. Thank you very much, Alex. Well, uh, finally, in October, I'm going to be hosting another Smile webinar about microsites. Uh, often seen as a necessary evil, but EduPack is changing that. It's empowering people in the education space to take back control of their wider digital estates. And I'm excited to introduce you to some of my co-founders on the project and tell you a little bit more about the project. We'll be streaming live on YouTube and LinkedIn, and you can register today over on our website. So you can visit the link on screen now. 
to get a roundup of the webinar resources, including recording uh, and links to all of the insight you've seen today. Sadly, we have had some technical glitches in our recording, so it won't be available immediately, uh, but I will get it on upload ASAP for you. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow, everything should be up there for you. Uh, on behalf of Alex from Akiro, Matt and the wider team at Smile and myself, thank you very much for joining us and see you again soon.